up? It is Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies back again. We are getting closer and closer and closer to the NBA Draft. By the time you see this video, it will be NBA Draft Day. Now, I just dropped Mock Draft 3.0. Thanks for all the support in the comments. It's doing well as far as views. But in this video, I'm going to drop the second round. Now, this is my first time doing a full second round mock draft, but I've had plenty of time. I've been preparing for this day since September last year. So second round mock draft, here we go. But before I get into it, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Hit the like button, share, comment. I try to respond to as many comments as possible. But again, thanks for the support. Like I really, really appreciate all the support. My channel has grown tremendously over the last year. And the feedback has been pretty good. Other than, you know, every once in a while, somebody tell me I'm stupid and I'm an idiot. And I don't know what I'm talking about. But all feedback is good feedback. So I appreciate it. But now let's get into the second round of the 2020 NBA Draft. This is the NBA Draft Junkies Mock Draft 3.0. I guess 3.0 Volume 2. I don't know. I haven't came up with a title. But let's start off with the first pick of the second round, pick number 31. It is the Dallas Mavericks. And I have the Mavericks selecting Robert Woodard from Mississippi State. Woodard is a strong, physical, switchy defender that I think has great 3 and D potential. As far as the Mavericks, they have the offense. I think they'll need to add a wing defender that can defend the LeBron James and Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, the James Hardens of the world. If James Harden stays in the Western Conference, I know the rumors are he's headed to Brooklyn. By the time this video airs, he might already be a Brooklyn net. But either way, I think Dallas needs to add a, a strong physical wing defender. But I really like his upside as a shooter. He shot 42% from three. It was only on 70 attempts, so the volume wasn't there. But I think that he could develop into a reliable shooter, especially in the corners. So... Robert Woodard to the Dallas Mavericks would be my choice at number 31. At number 32 is the Charlotte Hornets. I have them selecting Vernon Carey from Duke, so they didn't have to go too far to find their potential center of the future. Carey is an old-school, wide-body, back-to-the-basket, low-post scorer. Another one of these guys that I feel like was born in the wrong era. If this were the 2000 draft instead of 2020, I think he's a first-round pick. But he does show some flashes of shooting touch. He shot 38% from three, but it was only on about 21 attempts for his freshman year. So only time will tell, but the percentage was, was there. Like I said, a low sample size. The biggest issue with Kerry is staying out of foul trouble. If he can stay out of foul trouble, then I think that he has a shot at um, being a productive center in the NBA. But fouling is probably the main weakness or possibly the fact that he has a he has an old school game, but I think he should be able to come in and, and get some rotation minutes in Charlotte as a rookie. So I have the Charlotte Hornets at number thirty two, selecting Vernon Carey from Duke. At number thirty three, this is the third pick for the Minnesota Timberwolves, and I have them selecting a hometown kid, Zeke Nanaji from Arizona. In his freshman year, he averaged sixteen points, eight point six rebounds per game. I think he has upside as a pick and pop player. But I feel like he'll need to bulk up and add strength. But again, that's going to be a reoccurring theme for a lot of these prospects in this draft. So Zeke Nanaji from Arizona, staying home. Well, going to his hometown, Minnesota Timberwolves at number 33. All right, at number 34, if you saw the first video, Mock Draft 3.0, I mentioned I have no idea what Philadelphia is going to do. Daryl Morey is the general manager. Doc Rivers is the coach. I'm curious to see how that relationship works and just how this roster is going to be constructed in the near future. But either way, Philly needs shooting, and they need shooting bad. I feel like they need guard play. So I have them selecting Isaiah Joe from Arkansas. Isaiah Joe is a trigger-happy, confident sniper. Now, his percentages, his sophomore year dipped from his freshman year, but he shot 41% from three as a freshman. It was 34% as a sophomore. He could shoot off the dribble or coming off screen or off the ball motion plays. I think that he would be a very good complimentary piece or role player that will open up Philly's offense. But again, I'm curious to see what type of offense Philly runs this season with the new head coach 
and I have them selecting Malachi Flynn in the first round. So I'm giving them a little bit more guard help and another shooter in Isaiah Joe from Arkansas. At number 35, I have the Sacramento Kings. Sacramento just made a trade yesterday, sending Bogdan Bogdanovich to the Milwaukee Bucks. They got a little depth in return, but I still think that they could add some depth in the front line. So I have them selecting Daniel Orturu from Minnesota had a very, very productive sophomore year, especially on paper. Just look at the numbers. 20 points per game, 11 rebounds on 56% shooting. He averaged 2.5 blocks per game. He also shot 36% from three on 52 attempts. Not a large sample size, but I think it's good enough to show that he does have touch and he should be able to extend his range. Now, one thing about his game, it's a little raw. It's not visually pleasing. It's actually kind of ugly, to be honest. He's more so of a low post player, but he doesn't really have the strength to bang in the low post. I don't know if he has a role as just a, a shooter, but like I said, the potential of him as a shooter is there because he has pretty good touch. But this could be a steal for Sacramento at 35. Honestly, he could come in there and be their starting center because I feel like that is the position where Sacramento needs the most help at unless they plan on moving Marvin Bagley to the five, but that's a totally different story. But Daniel Orturo at number 35 to the Sacramento Kings, it could be one of the biggest steals of this draft. Back on the clock at number 36, I have the Philadelphia 76ers. And the last two picks, I had a point guard in Malachi Flynn. I had a shooting guard in Isaiah Joe. I'm going to go back to the wings and I'm going to add Jamias Ramsey from Texas Tech. Now let's hope the Sixers have better luck with Ramsey than they did with their last draft pick out of Texas Tech. Zaire Smith just hasn't been healthy and been able to give them any type of production. But Jamias Ramsey shot 42% from three as a freshman. His free throw percentage was around 64%. So you're going to have to decide if free throw percentage is a better indicator of shooting touch than his actual three-point numbers. Only time will tell. Although a little bit undersized at about 6'3", 6'4", I still think Jemias Ramsey could give Philadelphia or any team that drafts him a potential 3 and D wing. So Jemias Ramsey at number 36 to the Philadelphia 76ers. At number 37, I have the Washington Wizards selecting Nico Mannion. Now, Mannion was a five-star recruit coming out of college. And if you would have told me at this time last year that Nico Mannion was going to fall to the second round, I probably would have blocked you on social media if you made that. But just how the cookie crumbled, he fell to the second round. And I think it was largely due to his shooting numbers. He came in with a reputation as a good shooter. He only shot about 39% from the floor, about 32.7% from three. So those numbers played a major, major role in him falling this far. But I still like him as a playmaker. He's a traditional pass first point guard, and he was second in the Pac-10 in assists. I think this could be a good insurance policy for John Wall if he does return to form, and also for Nico Mannion. I mean, he goes to a situation where he can learn from one of the best point guards in the last decade. So I have Nico Mannion going to the Washington Wizards. Number 38 is the New York Knicks, and I think this is a good value pick for them. I have them selecting Tyler Bay from Colorado. Tyler Bay was someone that I had as a first-round grade on my last mock draft. I don't know why he fell. It was nothing that led to him falling other than the fact that I've had too much time to overthink all these picks. But I like Tyler Bay a lot. If you've been listening to my podcast, I've been calling him like a poor man, Sean Marion. Now, there's only one Sean Marion. There'll never be another Sean Marion, but I think Tyler Bay is a poor man Sean Marion. He's an active rebounder, rim runner. He's a vertical lob threat. He's undersized at 6'7". I think his natural position is a 4, but I think that with his athleticism and his motor and his defensive intangibles, he should be able to defend multiple positions. He's a guy that I think if he ends up in New York, he'll energize the garden because he's going to bring you maximum effort and he doesn't need the ball, so... Tyler Bay at number 38 to the New York Knicks would be my choice. At 39, I have the New Orleans Pelicans selecting Paul Reed from DePaul. Now, I like Paul Reed. I I just love what he brings to the table. I think his calling card in the NBA will be his defense and rebounding. But I do think that he has some skills on the offensive end that could be unleashed. But again, the defense is going to be where he makes his money. He averaged almost two blocks and two steals per game. I know the conference DePaul plays in is not one of their stronger conferences, but 
I just really like guys that have a skill set that they can hang their hat on. And so for New Orleans, I think they struggled on defense. The fit with Zion may be questionable, but I think he comes in on the second unit and, and just provides defense. So I have the Pelicans selecting Paul Reed at number 39. At number 40, I have the Memphis Grizzlies selecting Skylar Mays from LSU. Skylar is a player that I've I've got a chance to know, and I used to be the, the videographer for the Mo Williams Academy basketball program when we played on the Under Armour circuit, and Skylar was our point guard. It was a team that featured current NBA player Terrence Ferguson. But Skyler is one of my favorite players in this draft. I really like his versatility. I think what's hurting him in his draft stock is he's, he's a little older. He's 23, so he's like four years older than some of the prospects in this draft. But I like what he brings to the table. He can play the one. He can play the two. He was a very efficient scorer his senior year at LSU. He's just fun to watch. He like has this old school game like – you ever been to the Y, you see that old guy that's playing in sweats. He's using very little effort, but he's effective and you can't stop him. Well, that's Skylar Mays. He has like this old school game, even though he's young, but old for this class. Anyway, forget all that. I think Skylar Mays could come in and make an impact as a rookie. So I have Memphis selecting Skylar Mays at number 40. With the 41st pick, I have the San Antonio Spurs selecting Reggie Perry from Mississippi State. Perry is the second Mississippi State player selected in the second round. Earlier on the mock draft 3.0, I had San Antonio drafting Patrick Williams. Reggie Perry would add some depth to the front line. He was somewhat of a stat stuffer in college, 17 points, 10 rebounds, 2.3 assists, averaged a little over a block a game. I think what he brings to the table is his activity, energy, high motor guy. He does have some low post game, but he's a little undersized at 6'9", but I think Reggie Perry to San Antonio would be a good fit. At number 42, I have the New Orleans Pelicans selecting Cassius Winston from Michigan State. If you saw my last mock, Cassius was a first-round pick. I have him going to New York. It's another situation where he dropped, but for no particular reason. I love Cassius Winston's game. Arguably the best shooter in this draft class simply because he has over 600 attempts on his resume, shot over 40% from three, can score on action plays, can shoot off the dribble, just has all these winning intangibles I love for a backup point guard. I know he doesn't pass the eye test as far as athleticism, and a lot of people may not believe that he has a high upside because of his age, but I love Cassius Winston's game. I love the fact that he has like this combination of street flash and flair with fundamentals so I, I the best way for me to describe his game is hood fundamental but he has a winning mentality and he's played winning basketball and he's ready to contribute right away there'd be a log jam as far as guards in new orleans they just added two more guards in exchange for drew holiday but i like cassius winston here at number 43 i have the sacramento Kings selecting jordan noir from louisville he's somewhat of a tweener but I feel like he's most effective as a small ball four. He's a good shooter that connected on over 40% of his threes, and he shows flashes of being able to attack closeouts. He's capable of creating his own shot in certain mismatches, but he's very good on the glass. He averaged nearly eight boards a game. Now, there's a lot of redundancy in Sacramento, especially since they made the trade with the Bucks and they've added additional players to the roster. So who knows what they do with this pick, if they keep it or not. But Jordan Noir is who I have the Kings selecting at number 43. At number 44, I have the Chicago Bulls selecting Elijah Hughes from Syracuse. Hughes is a bucket getter. He's a 6'6 wing that can really fill it up. He averaged 19 points per game and chipped in around five rebounds and three assists. But since he went to Syracuse, there will always be concerns about his man-to-man defense. But he'd give the Bulls additional help on the wing. So I like Elijah Hughes to Chicago at number 44. At number 45, I have the Orlando Magic selecting Abdoulaye Ndoye out of France. 6'7 point guard, or he can be a combo guard. But he kind of fits the bill of what John Hammond looks for in a prospect. He can defend multiple positions. He's long arms. I think he has like a seven-foot wingspan. And he does a little bit of everything. He can get to the rim. He can knock down open shots. He can make plays for others. So I like him in Orlando. And it pairs him up with another French guard and Evan Fournier. 
depending on if Evan Fournier is going to be there or in their long-term plans. So Abdullah and Doy at 45 to the Orlando Magic. At number 46, it's my Portland Trailblazers, and I have them selecting a local player in Oregon point guard, Peyton Pritchard. Peyton Pritchard had a fantastic senior season. He averaged 20 points per game and led the Pac-12 in assists. He also shot over 41% from three. Now, he could be the Blazers' backup point guard from day one because I think Ant Simons is more of a combo. The Blazers rank near the bottom of the league in assists, and so, in my opinion, adding a playmaker was one of the top priorities for this offseason, so Peyton Pritchard should be able to come in and fill that void. At number 47, it is the Boston Celtics again. It feels like this is their fourth or fifth pick. I think it's number four, but I have them selecting Trey Jones. Now, I don't think he'll be available, but he's fallen to number 47 on my draft board. I don't think Boston keeps all their picks either. So if they do keep their second round pick and he is available, I think this would be a good choice here. But who knows what's going to go on with Boston? Who knows what's going to go on with this draft? But for the sake of this video, I have Trey Jones at number 47 to the Boston Celtics. Jones is an improving outside shooter. His three-point shooting jumped up around 10% from his freshman and sophomore year. I think he'll carve out a role in the NBA as a good on-ball defender and high IQ point guard that excels at managing and running a team. Again, I don't think he'll be available at number 47, but if he is, this would be a good fit for the Boston Celtics. At number 48, I have the Golden State Warriors selecting Emmanuel quickly. Now, this is unfair to give Golden State another shooter, but I believe in this draft, you can get some good value picks in the late 40s or early 50s. So quickly to Golden State would be an excellent fit, in my opinion. Quickly shot over 42% from three in his sophomore season and was named the SEC Player of the Year. It's tough to crack the rotation of a contender as the 48th pick, but I think quickly has a chance, in my opinion. At number 49, I have the Philadelphia 76ers selecting Jalen Harris. In my opinion, he's one of the most underrated players in this draft class. He's a very good athlete with good size at 6'5", where he can play both guard spots. One of the better rebounding guards in this draft class. This is the third of four second round picks for Philly, so we'll see if they keep this pick. But I like Jalen Harris here at Philly, which gives them plenty of wings to choose from. All right, moving on to number 50. We're going to go a little faster here. I have the Atlanta Hawks selecting Killian Tilly from Gonzaga. Tilly is a 6'10 senior out of France that has a defined role as a three-point specialist. Hopefully his injury issues are past him because I really think that injuries have robbed him of a great college career. At number 51, I have the Golden State Warriors selecting Jay Scrub, the junior college product. Scrub is an excellent athlete that dominated the JUCO level. Now, he shot 46% from three as a freshman, but it dropped down to 33% as a sophomore. But I think he could spend a lot of time in Santa Cruz with the G League and could be a very productive NBA player down the line once he gains some experience. So at number 51, I have the Golden State Warriors selecting Jay Scrub. At 52, I have the Sacramento Kings back on the board. Devin Dotson out of Kansas, the speedster averaged 18 points per game as a sophomore at KU. Dotson's a fearless driver that loves to put pressure on defenses and getting to the rack. And one of the things about him is he loves to finish through contact. So there's a log jam at guard in Sacramento, but I think Devin Dotson could be a decent pick here. 53 is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And if you saw my first two picks for them in the first round, I had them swinging for the fences, and it's no different here. I have Kareem Monet out of Canada. The youngster from the Montreal area passed on major college offers to stay in the draft. He's a project, but he's a 6'5 athletic combo guard with a ridiculous wingspan and upside, especially on the defensive end. I saw him play last year at the under-19s in Greece, and he kind of reminds me of a bigger version of Terry Rozier. I like the kid. I think his stock would have been a little higher if he would have went to college, but hey, he decided to enter the draft, and I think the Thunder could swing for the fences again at number 53 with Kareem Manet. At 54, I have the Indiana Pacers selecting Yudoka Azubuki from Kansas. He's a big physical presence at 6'11", 260. Dude is pretty much automatic once he gets a paint touch. He shot over 74% for his career at Kansas. Yes, you heard that right. 74% from the floor, not from the free throw line. 74% from the floor. His game is a little throwback, a little outdated. There are going to be concerns about him playing defense in space, 
but he could have a role similar to what Boban has in the NBA. But again, 74% from the floor is pretty ridiculous. At number 55, I have the Brooklyn Nets, whose names are all over the rumors, selecting Najee Marshall out of Xavier. He's a 6'7", 220-pound Swiss Army knife that fills up the stat sheet. I think he does have a lot of potential to become a, you know, like a, a wing playmaker, a wing initiator. I think he needs to improve his outside shot, but I like his potential here. So at 55, I have the Brooklyn Nets selecting Najee Marshall. At 56, I have the Charlotte Hornets selecting Cassius Stanley. This is their second player out of Duke. We've all seen Cassius Stanley's highlights. He is an athletic freak. I mean, dude is bouncy as hell. Hopefully, he can develop into a 3 and D wing. I think his age has hurt his draft stock. He's like 21 years old, finished in his freshman year at Duke, which is weird to me because when I was 21, I was like a senior in college. But, again, it's the upside is there. You can't find athleticism like this, and if he can just become a consistent outside shooter, I think that he'd be a very valuable 3 and D wing in the NBA. So I have Cassius Stanley from Duke going number 56 to the Charlotte Hornets. 57, it's the Los Angeles Clippers for the first time, and I have them selecting Yam Madar from Israel. I like to call him the Israeli version of Pat Beverly, so it's ironic that he'll be on the same team as Pat Beverly based off today if Patrick Beverly is not moved. But Madar is a pest on defense, and he loves to defend full court. He's like that dude, as soon as you walk into the gym, he's going to pick you up and guard you all over the floor. Defense is his calling card, but he's a good playmaker, and he plays with a little flash and flair. Kind of reminds me of Puerto Rican guard Carlos Arroyo a little bit, but I like Madar here. Hopefully he gets a shot. I think that he could possibly... Crack their rotation, and he'll, he'll give them another defender. So, Yamadar at 57 to the L.A. Clippers. At 58, I'm going with another international prospect. It is Vic Kriyeshi. He is currently out because he tore his ACL a few weeks back. So, the earliest he would be available is the start of the 21-22 season. But he's a big guard. He's like 6'5", love to push the pace. I love his game. He is going to be a NBA player, in my opinion. I just hate the fact that he's out. Hopefully, he can recover from his injuries. I think he would have been selected a little bit higher if he didn't have the injury that he suffered a few weeks back. But I have the Sixers selecting Vit Kriyeshi at number 58. And for the third pick in a row, I have an international player. I have the Toronto Raptors selecting Paul Ibois. Now, if you've been paying attention to my channel, I've done a video on Ibois. He even came on the show and we did an interview. I had a chance to sit and talk with him. He is a super athletic combo forward, mostly a power forward, but he's super athletic. He's from Cameroon. He's a late bloomer. He's been playing in Italy. He is raw, but he has all the physical tools. So I like him here for Toronto, especially because the Raptors have done an excellent job in developing young talent. Lastly, at number 60, it is the New Orleans Pelicans, and I have them selecting another international player, even though he's been here in the States for the past few years, or Merritt Yurtseven. It just feels like he's been on mock drafts for four years now. He's a skilled big man who, in my opinion, should have entered the draft in 2017 out of Turkey. But I think he's a better player now than he was then. But for the sake of his draft stock, I think that he would have gone a lot higher if he entered the draft back in 2017 or even 2016. But I think that would be a good fit for the Pelicans because he's, he's talented. He definitely has some skills, even though it's a little bit outdated. But I really like him here. <sighs> All right, that is it. Man, I am done with mock drafts for this draft class. I've spent thousands upon thousands of hours reviewing films, studying these guys. I've made over 100 videos on YouTube. Hopefully, the draft doesn't change too much. I know since I started recording, I saw a Woj update that the Knicks and the Jazz made a trade. So, again, hopefully this, this video is still somewhat relevant by draft time. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks again to everybody that has been supporting the channel all draft season. Thanks to all the new followers. 2021 is going to be special. I'll be bigger and better. So once again, it's Raphael NBA Draft Junkies, and I am out.